everyone. It's Russ of Aquaramax here. I am here with Laura Ripple of Smugbug. Welcome, Laura. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. I've been excited for this. Um, Laura is uh, runs Smugbug. If you haven't been to smugbug.com, you got to check it out. And uh, we'll make sure that she has a chance to tell you all about the, the best places to get in contact with her and all of that thing, all that kind of thing. So uh, first of all, I want to just... Uh, ask you the question we ask a lot of our our uh, guests is what are what are you working with we know where you're working with isopods but can you tell us a little bit more about that and what else you're working with? uh well my goal has been to collect as many different species and more of isopods as possible um i have them in large tubs so i'll produce hundreds or thousands at a time and so i will also isolate my own uh, mutations and i have about 10 projects right now uh, of mm -hmm. mutations of different species that i've been isolating um i do import um when i can um there's a company that imports legally from europe so i import through them mm -hmm. i don't import from southeast asia i know a lot of people ask me about cubara species I don't get those until the people in Europe get them because the laws between Southeast Asia and Europe are different than Southeast Asia to America. Mm -hmm. And so I wait until my uh, the people I know in Europe have them and have cultivated them and then I import them here. And that probably makes it even easier because they've somewhat acclimated to captive life over a couple of generations. And mm -hmm. yeah, A lot nice. of the problem with like Cubaris is a lot of times they get imported straight here from Asia and they're all wild caught individuals and people will be so excited because they like birth a litter in captivity. And then the females usually die from stress. And so when I know that they've already been bred in captivity, I know they're not traveling and traveling and traveling. And then they come with me to their final resting place. And it's like, Oh, I guess we really don't know how to take care of these yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's very good. So uh, how many, how many different species do you have right now? I need to do another inventory. Uh, I did a count, but I haven't been able to actually plug it in. I think I have 95 species and 230 different cultivars. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <Yeah. laughs> so in this space, is it all in your house or do you have it in a separate facility? It's all in my house right now. We, um, we have small children. And so it's all in the lower part of our house. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about their lungs because I read that like their surfactant is not developing until they're about three years old. And so, and there's always like the worry. We have reptiles too, so there's the worry about like salmonella because you don't know who has it, who doesn't. And kids don't. They put everything in their mouths. You know, they're not sure. trustworthy. And so we have everything downstairs. So we don't have to worry about the mold or the fungus or whatever. And um, we keep everything else up here. Mm -hmm. that isn't <laughs> that isn't creepy crawlers <laughs> cool yeah space is always a consideration too so it's it's nice that you have enough room to keep all those i i'm finding myself getting to the point where i'm really having to think about space <laughs> yeah ben got this ridiculous house when he was a bachelor and it worked out perfectly <laughs> <laughs> when he moved me in here, I'm like, this is great. I have, I had 40 lizards at the time. I'm like, I'm going to put them all here. And he's like, I like you a lot. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun. Well, let's see. I want to give a shout out to some folks that are in the chat already and see what people are asking. We had um, Jeff and Frank DeTank were in here early. Noah, Joel. Let's see. Um, Hyla Regillas, Isopods, Sharon Anderson, Heather Jensen. Oh, Sharon has some coming from you, arriving tomorrow. Nice. Oh, fun. Critters and more, Fishaholic, Ashley N. Mystery Unboxing, Crystals, Pets and Plants, Newt's Commander. Sorry if I missed somebody. There's Wally, Wally of Supreme Gecko, Sandy Sizemore, Arthropod Ambassadors, Holly C., Sean Meister, and My My, Toilet Pete. Wow. A lot of people. I probably missed them. Toilet Pete follows me on Instagram. I recognize his username. <laughs> oh, we got a super chat from Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. They thank you very much. They say, love smug bug. Got all four of my Porcelionides Purinosis from you. Are you going to have orange cream available? 
Is that the pied one? That's the pied orange, yeah. The orange crust with Oreo crumbles, yeah. I am working on it. I cool. haven't seen anybody producing it yet, and I'm trying to work on my own culture. Oh, okay. But cool. I haven't even isolated it yet, so hopefully hasn't, we get hasn't there. isolated yet. Okay, cool. So let's see. Oh, Sean Meister, I just got to tell you, I tried to email you back, and I don't think it worked. Something went wrong. So please email me again, Sean Meister. Um, okay, so. Oh, Arthur Pod Ambassador says, congrats on your snake discovery feature. Want some of those hissing isopods now. <laughs> They're so fun. They're so mad all the time. Is that Armadillo Officinalis? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Oh, Cole has a shipment coming tomorrow from you as well. And and I got to tell you that uh, all the isopods that I got from you, so fantastic. I've been enjoying them a lot. Um, oh, I'm so the, glad. I started out with the lavas. That was the first group that I ordered. And I have tons of baby lavas, which is great. The Porcello Escaper lava. And then everything else in the second shipment is now breeding. And I've got like a lot of little, um, like the Porcelio Flava Marginatus, tons of babies, just everything. So it's awesome. Those are I, so funny because they're so bulky. They're kind of like Ornatus, but like a little smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And the way they run up high up on their legs is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> they're just fun. All right. And oh yeah, Supreme Gecko says this is a two for with Russ last night with ISO Buddies and again tonight. Double your pleasure. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen the ISO Buddies, I just uh, was interviewed on their channel yesterday, so everybody can check that out. And I'm going to be posting that on my social media soon. If you missed it and you don't know how to get in contact with that, so um, Mohammed wants to know if you have heard of any talk of new Armadillidium nasatum morphs, specifically some melanistic forms, because He's working on one at the moment. I actually have not heard anybody talk about isolating melanistic. So that's really exciting. That I think is. I did see somebody talk about having a pie mutation pop up in culture, mm -hmm. which is fun, but I haven't seen melanistic. I don't either. That's that's pretty fantastic. It's, it's really an underrated species, I think. Mm -hmm. And just th there's a decent amount of variety with the oranges and the pearls and the whiteouts and adding melanistic in there would be amazing. The pearls are so fun because they have such a variety. Like mm -hmm. they literally look like pearls between uh, like they get cream and they get white. 10% um, of the males have spotting, which I think is really interesting. And I actually cool. I spent like an hour the other day just sexing them. And it was ma all males that had the spotting and it was just 10% of them. Huh. Interesting. That's pretty cool. I'm, I'm going to have to get that more. I don't have it. I don't have the pearls. I have, um, just the whiteouts and the uh, peaches. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to get some more. Uh, Has your peaches like started turning yellow? I haven't seen any yellows. I've seen some, they, once in a while they'll throw wild types, but I haven't seen any yellows. That's cool. A bunch of mine like get kind of darkish, like not wild type, but like purplish. Uh -huh. And then they're all the other way on the other end of the spectrum where they're so yellow, they're almost white. Whoa. Yeah, I totally mm -hmm. haven't seen that. The snake discovery video, they kind of pointed out in a couple of them. And after I watched it, I was like, oh, I didn't. So I went and poked around in there and I'm like, geez, <laughs> I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> well, that's cool. I'm mean, gonna, I, that kind of happened with my orange vigors. I've had orange vigors pop out like lemon yellow, quite a mm -hmm. lot of them. So I'm trying to isolate those and see what I get. But uh, yeah, I haven't seen that with this autumn yet. That's cool. So. Peter March is asking, he says, dwarf whites are supposed to be easy, but every time I order them, they look dead. <laughs> What's up with that? Uh, Peter is one of my friends, and he knows how much I hate dwarf whites. <laughs> are, are Hi, we Peter. The, are we in same, <laughs> we're in the same club. I'm not a fan of dwarf whites myself. <laughs> what, would you, what would you say to that? Uh, dwarf whites have a tendency to play dead. Um, they get very upsetty spaghetti. Like you blow on them and they play turtle on their back and they hold completely still. A lot of times they'll curl into this like little C shape because dead bugs aren't appetizing bugs. And like you just leave them alone for just a little bit and 
they usually will start moving or a lot of customers they'll be like all right you know just lay them out like leave them alone and it's like you can even take a video i'd rather tell you from the video if they're dead or not and they email me half an hour later and they'll say oh well i just laid them out in the enclosure and i came back half an hour later and they all burrowed down so i guess they're fine yeah yeah they're one of those uh that uh tonic immobility thing is they're experts at that along with a few other species now, I really like the uh, Agabiformis lentis when they play dead because mm -hmm. they literally splay their legs out flat and they throw themselves on their back. Oh, and nice. the, the dwarf whites, they curl into like a little C, but the um, lentis like lay completely flat. And it's really mm -hmm. funny when they're um, adult females, when they're gravid because their marsupium pokes out. <laughs> and they're, like Their little marsupium full of these eggs just practically glows while they're laying on their back. Huh. It seems like that would be... a not so much of a survival advantage, just like, here, eat my progeny. Right? Yeah, we looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Dimata, I'm not sure how to say this name, Dimata Kansley, something like that. What are your experience with breeding Armadillidium parake? Oh, they're really easy. They, um, the Vulgare, I've been having issues with because they are, seem to be more picky with moisture. The parake love to be really soggy. Um, they love a lot of moisture. Um, they have a lot of variety in their coloration. They'll range from like a deep gray to an almost white. And they are, have been one of my most prolific species can, in comparison to the Nisadum and the Vulgari. Hmm. Um, they don't even seem to have seasons like the Vulgari do. They breed constantly year round. Uh, I might have to get into some of those. Uh, I have never kept that species. And uh, the more I hear about it, the more I'm intrigued. It's been really popular lately. Yeah. A lot of people have been getting into it. I think it's because they have a really textured back too. Like they have little bumps and kind of spines all over them that you can see. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing that in some of your, your photos and thought, oh, that is kind of an interesting isopod. Should check it out. So Muhammad is saying the uh, Nazatim is working. It may not be true melanism, but the stripes don't show at all. Even the second generation isn't showing the stripes or the markings on the, the uh, Nazatum. That's pretty cool. I've never yeah, seen any of the markings. Mm -hmm. so, except that's for the usually white how I tell them between Bulgari is looking for the little spots on their back. Yeah, yeah, that's the easiest, fast uh, check. That's true. So um, Ashley's wondering if anybody else is having issues with uh, the YouTube. Um, is everybody seeing this uh, without latency? Is it working? Let's see. Okay. Um, so Noah is asking if you're going to carry uh, Philoskia muscorum in your shop. I am culturing them. Mm -hmm. um, I've been having some difficulty because they like to be cooler. They like to be in the low 70s. And um, my work area downstairs, I keep at 75 or higher uh, for the reptiles. Um, but I've expanded into the other part of my basement, which is cooler, and they seem to be doing better. Oh, okay. But they're really they're really tricky because they like being cool and they like being moist. I could see how that would be a problem when you at room temperatures they're not happy. That would make it tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I practically have to put them on the concrete <laughs> to get them to stay cool. <laughs> well, Truffle Pig Forty Two, one of our patrons, is asking if you have any suggestions for a. Kenyan sand bow enclosure that is so dry and is wondering if Porcelio dilatatus might work or if there's something different that would be better. The problem with uh, very arid enclosures that don't have any moisture is isopods can't survive. Like some people get away with, they'll have like a moist area for the isopods to retreat to, but the isopods won't necessarily thrive, especially in a sand bow enclosure because they like to be on literally sand. Right. Um, and they won't really leave that moist area and clean it. So I know that a lot of people for setups like that, what they like to use is beetles because the beetles can stand a really arid environment and they actually will um, clean up the poop and sheds and stuff from the snakes. Oh, that's a good idea. Like uh, you could probably use um, superworm beetles. In yeah, there. I know those are very popular. I, I've even heard of some people doing dubia, but I know that dubia do like a lot of humidity as well. Humidity, yeah. I've got uh, the superworm beetles in my leopard gecko enclosure. And mm -hmm. I have I have Porcelionides prunosus in there as well, and they do well. But a leopard gecko is not going to be nearly as dry as a Kenyan sand boa. Yeah. So they that's... they can do pretty well if there's like 
I want to say like a 30 to 40 percent gradient or even like a real because like if you mix I know I think in the leopard geckos they mix in dirt in the substrate for the piles because mm -hmm. they can do really well with that because they yeah. that retains moisture right yeah and that's how they're doing in mine I have bio dude substrate in there and it's it's not just sand and it's uh, in fact there's very little sand in the substrate to be honest and it, it works perfectly well and she's been in there for years with these porcelainitis prunosis doing great and then I added the superworm beetles maybe a year or so ago and works well. And uh, so, yeah, I think that might be a, a better option, beetles. Leopards are so fun and bile. They just get into it with all the digging and stuff, and they're so much more active. They are. They seem to just thrive. It's, it's a lot more fun. So hopefully that helps Ash, Truffle Pig, 42. Um, Boat Chambers wants to know how long it takes for Armadillidium vulgari to reproduce. They've been, they started a colony four weeks ago and haven't seen reproduction yet. I think I know uh, what you're going to say, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, it depends on the size of animals received. I have had vulgari reproduce at a fourth the adult size. So like I always estimate between three and five molts out from uh, being born. Um, my vulgare, I've noticed, seem to be seasonal readers. So mine, like almost all of mine on the website are out of stock because they're not reproducing. They should start reproducing in the summer. Mm -hmm. So if they're large enough, they should start showing. And they, it's difficult because they're so small. They right. must be a millimeter or half a millimeter um, in length when they're born. And so... I don't really see the babies until they're like two or three molts out when they're almost big enough to reproduce. Yeah. yeah that but sense. it takes, uh, the female gestates for six weeks. And um, I think it takes two to three months to get to breeding size, but it has to be the right time of year for them to reproduce. Um, a good way to boost reproduction is to offer a large protein source like fish flakes. Um, some people actually offer meat, but I don't like to because it smells really bad. Um, some people offer dog food, um, but that also molds. It gets like this weird purple green mold. And yeah. then uh, calcium source and uh, calcium sources that can be used are cuddle bone. Um, I have four people saving all of their eggshells for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I give those to all of my ice bobs. I have a bunch of videos of like, I even have expanses, baby expanses, just chewing on um, the eggshells. Um, limestone, a lot of people like using that for cubaris, but I have um, limestone pellets and all of my armadillidium, like they'll be swarming over it and they'll be eating it. Some people offer calcium rich substrate, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I like using substrate made for plants because it's rich in calcium and the isopods really seem to thrive in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we sell cuddle bone, then wants everybody to know. <laughs> we have a lot of cuddle bone in our basement. <laughs> um, but the cuddle bone is also really fun. I wish I had brought up an example because in the armadillidium, especially, they're so calcium hungry, you can actually see them eating like tunnels through the cuddle bone. And then as it gets eaten down, like I'll lift it up and it's just filled with like little babies hiding in the cuddle bone. Uh, cool. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, I, I don't know if I've ever observed that. That's pretty cool. I, I've thrown cuddle bone in there and seen them eat it, but I've never noticed actually having babies in it. That's cool. Uh, all excellent suggestions. I love that. I have chickens and so I have no shortage of eggshells. And I'll mm -hmm. grind up the eggshells and I have like a two pounds of ground eggshells in my closet. And I'll just, you know, I, I can have that bin and just shake it out into there and um, and then just replenish it whenever I need to with the chickens. It's nice. A lot of people uh, think that you have to like sterilize eggshells, but you mm -hmm. don't have to do it for the isopods. The only danger with throwing in like eggshells that are still wet is that the babies can get stuck in the mucus. But I, I just let them air dry in a bucket and then I put on a glove and I crush them and I throw them in. Um, what's fun with the dwarves is putting in a half eggshell because the dwarf isopods will actually use it as a hide. You'll mm -hmm. find them all along. Well, Ben, um, do you want to turn on the isocam? Ben just brought an example of isopods burrowing into a cuddle bone. Oh, cool. I'll put on the isocam um, so I can show you. Let's see. I'm going to pull that up. There we go. Oh, it's not quite up yet. Oh, here it comes. There it is. 
Nice. How's that coming through, everybody? You can see them. They, they tuck themselves into this. Was a big flat thing of cuddle bone, and they actually ate their way in there. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah, yeah, that's something I've never seen. That's pretty awesome. Thanks, Ben. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Catch up here. I think I need to go to Patreon and pull up a couple of those comments because we haven't done those yet. So Sandy Sizemore has some questions for us about, first of all, uh, Hilaria Brevicornis. She wants to know, how did you happen upon that isopods? How rare are they? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll answer. A I'll ask a couple of the questions and ask more of you, as you've answered them, so you don't get overwhelmed with uh, too many at once. So, how did you happen upon them, and how rare are they? I actually, I first saw them uh, when Alan Grass, Gross, I think is his name, uh, with Captain mm -hmm. Zapata. He was auctioning them off in a Facebook group, and I'd never heard of them before. And then I made friends with a man in Italy. His name is Marcos, and he actually produced them. And so he uh, studies, he doesn't really breed isopods, but he studies them a lot. Like he reads a lot of texts and researches a lot. And so he told me about them and I was following his posts. And uh, after, I actually lost Alan's auction, so I had to find somewhere else to get them. <laughs> and then I messaged Ellen and I was like, please, please, please. Like my daughter is the same age as your son. I'm sure we could work something out. It's <laughs> like, oh, it's fine. I'll just send them to you, Laura. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So I got some from Alan and I got some from my friend in Italy and that's what started getting my culture going. Cool. So it sounds like they're fairly rare in the hobby. At least they were when you got them. Are they still fairly rare in the hobby? I don't really see anyone else offering them. Um, they have, they reproduce really slowly. They have this really unique aspect where the females only produce a brood once. And it's not like they brood and then they die. It's just they only they only brood once and they build a burrow and they line it with actually like tree roots and mold and they feed their babies off of that. And they'll sit and they'll hold their babies in between their legs until they're like two molts out, but then they guard them after that. It's a really unique motherly species. But because of its slow breeding cycle um, and for the long time it takes for them to reproduce, that they're not as prolific as like say scaber. Oh, okay. I think I produce a thousand scavers a month or if not more, but I've only let go, I think, 50 groups or so of Hilaria since I started um, breeding them three years ago. They're just so much less prolific. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, so how, I guess you kind of answered the one about after the females give birth and raise their young, how much longer do they live? It's just that they, they reproduce once, but then they'll just live for an indeterminate period of time afterwards? I think in the three years I've kept them, I've found five dead ones. And I started out with about 60. Okay. So they don't, they, I think they just live on like old ladies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Enjoying mm -hmm. their lives but not having any more kids. That is a really interesting thing for uh, invertebrates. That doesn't tend to happen all that often. That's interesting. It, it is really unique. I've never, I haven't read about that happening in any other invertebrates. Because oh. most like... Most of them like birth and then they die or like they let their babies eat their body or something. Right. They're either one like a, an R strategist that basically dies after reproduction or they reproduce multiple times mm -hmm. and, and death and, and reproduction are not necessarily connected. That's interesting. Uh, do you know if the males fight each other for females? The Hilaria, I don't believe so. They have a different tactic. Instead of fighting each other off, they do what's called a nuptial ride. And so the male will attach himself to the back of the female, and he will remain attached for up to three weeks so no other males can fertilize her during her fertile period. Cool. Hmm. So, I mean... An extreme form of It's kind of like you're just like laying with food underneath you as a kid. So no one else can get it. <laughs> <laughs> like you don't have to fight it if they can't reach it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Huh. That That is interesting. So I know that lots of isopods mate guard, but I guess they just take it to an extreme. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. I know that like the giant Spanish ones, like 
the mm-hmm. Hoffman's Eggy, like their big um, Europods in the back. They'll actually, when I made them mad a couple of times, they'll stick them straight up and they'll like try and feed you with them. And <laughs> I have come across them like missing antenna, like missing Europods because they get into these big fights, but I've never seen anything missing with the Hilaria ever. Okay. Interesting. So you just mentioned Portelli Hoffman's egg guy. So this would be a good time to bring up this question from Sandy too. What are your top five largest isopods in terms of length? Um, I believe Hoffman's egg guy is considered to be the largest. Uh, there's some debate if Magnificus is just as large. They're really similar in my opinion, but I, officially, according to all the scientific papers, it's Hoffman's egg guy. Uh, Wagneri is relatively new, Porcelia Wagneri, those are also quite large. They look just like Magnificus to me, except for completely black. Mm-hmm. Are those except, the ones that get the kind of slight bluish tint to them sometimes? Kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. They, I want to say that their name means rat, but I'm not sure. But they're just this big black isopod. The, the really interesting looking. <laughs> hmm. I have to check some of those out. So Critters and More wants to know if um, you're going to be updating your spreadsheet soon. Didn't see any Armadillium Werneri on it, which I received from you recently. I uh, do plan on updating it. Uh, I had an issue where somebody was taking my data and claiming it as their own without giving credit. And so now I have to copyright it every time I update it. Mm. Uh, so I am researching the, with all these Kibara species, and I have a bunch in my possession. I've been trying to like take notes to add to the spreadsheet for each of the individual species because prior it was just one big column because I wasn't keeping that many Kibaras because I was waiting until people were reproducing them in captivity ex- um, exclusively. So I've been working and taking notes on the different species, like how fast they produce, if they prefer this, if they prefer that. And then once I'm done studying those, I'm gonna add that all into the spreadsheet and then I'll be updating it. I can't really give an exact time, um, but it's a work in progress. I'm hoping to have it done before the end of the year. Awesome. Okay, John Racine, another one, Critters and More and John Racine, both some of our patrons here, says, could you both give your thoughts on your favorite species that are not common in the hobby yet? Okay, my absolute favorite one is the Purcellio Werneri because they look like living little feathers. I have them here. Well, let's take a look. I chicken scratched and all of these. There it is. I'm gonna turn on this up close cam. Yeah, here we go. Let me put it on solo mode. There we go. The bugs are ready when the camera is. Oh, here they are. Yep, I can see them. They do look like feathers, don't they? (laughs) They're so fun. And they uh, squish themselves down as flat as they can as a defense mechanism. They breed really well. I always seem to have a bunch of them. And they're actually pretty docile for handling as well. Yeah, nice. They, they remind me a little bit of Flava Marginatus in their patterning. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are it very cool. A, a little bit wider, I think, but do you see how flat he is? Yeah, yeah, they look very flat. When I open their tub and lift up their cardboard, they all just kind of shrink in as tight as they can to it. It's so funny. <laughs> That's cool. Mm, very cool. Porcelio Werneri. Nice. So let's see. I've got some more comments here. A lot of people are asking about Cubaras pandas. Um, if there are any care tips for those? They like it warm. Like it warm. Um, they breed really well when you give them a lot of calcium and a lot of protein. But I cooled all of my geckos down to 65 this winter, and they did not like it. They like to be at least 75 Fahrenheit or higher, and then they breed really well. Uh, A tip that with most Cubara species is they like at least six inches of substrate or more. 
Okay. They, um, I read a lot of reports that they find them climbing up on uh, limestone walls. I haven't really been able to replicate that or know them climb, notice them climbing a lot, but they do really seem to enjoy burrowing. If they don't have enough substrate, they seem to have a lot of issues shedding. So I wonder if that like helps them retain humidity and moisture, but that's how I've had the most success. Okay, yeah, those are great tips there. So Erin of Arthropod Ambassadors is saying that she ordered 200 pandas, they all came in dead, and was wondering about the shipping method. She says she prefers moist paper towel and slow release heat pack, not too close to them. How do you two ship ISOs? Uh, I just want to clarify those weren't for me because I've never sent 200 pandas. No, um, I, I'm sure they weren't, yeah. <laughs> I have a blog on Smugbug that actually describes how I recommend shipping methods, especially for people who are visual learners like me. Uh, but what I recommend for shipping isopods is to have every single package insulated with at least a half inch of styrofoam. Um, this helps prevent temperature fluxes because I found a lot of isopods, their issue is not so much like the extremes in heat or cold, but if there's a large fluctuation while they're traveling. Mm -hmm. And so that prevents the fluctuation from happening. I ship all of my isopods in deli cups. Um, the size of the deli cup depends on the amount and the size of the species. Uh, for the Cubaris, I always ship them eight ounces or bigger because they're so sensitive and they have room to spread out. I ship them on speg sphagnum medium that's moist. Mm -hmm. They A lot of people have a lot of success with paper towel. I like to use sphagnum because it seems to retain water better. What paper towel does retain it better, but like the sphagnum is like made for it. Like they, if I read up about it and like the way that they hold and travel water through themselves is really cool. And another bonus that you can't give a paper towel is they actually eat the sphagnum. So if they're in mm -hmm. transit longer than intended, um, it'll help them survive longer. I pack everything with newspaper tightly because it prevents them from being jostled around and it also will insulate them from any heat. And then I use either cold packs, cryo packs, or heat packs, depending on how hot the destination is. If it's below 40, we put heat packs and we mark them held at a hub um, because, I mean, I've had people at FedEx deliver packages and not ring my bell, and so we'll be sitting out there for two hours before I realize it's there. Yeah. And if it's a hot porch, if it's like 80 Fahrenheit, that'll cook with whatever's in the box. Right. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Yeah. I think we do a lot of the same things. I have been using paper towels because uh, when I applied for my permit, that was one of the conditions that I put in. And I think it mm -hmm. just depends when you are, when you're requesting your permit, it depends on what you put in. I think I could get sphagnum cleared because for springtails, I did get sphagnum cleared, I think. I got, I got sphagnum cleared mm -hmm. on all of mine. They just don't want dirt. Because yeah, dirt yeah. can bring pathogens with it. Right. So I might actually see if I can get an amendment next time I update and see if I can do sphagnum because I do appreciate the advantages you mentioned. And I have had paper towels if it gets stuck too long in transit. I've had them dry out sometimes. If it's been mm -hmm. like longer than a week, sometimes they get stuck, you know, longer than a week. It's not common, but it happens. And it happened to me recently. I had a fairly big order go out and like 10 packages got delayed or something. It was ridiculous. And some of them, some of them dried out. So it was sad. Not all of them, but some of them did. I don't think I'm on the stream visually anymore. <laughs> did you get kicked off? What happened? I, I when It must have been when I did, uh, let me see. Uh, up close cam. There we go. <laughs> up close cam. Sorry about that. Sorry, I didn't even notice because um, I was just so interested in talking to you and I can see you the whole time. So I didn't even think about it. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, my screen looks different. So sorry, everybody. Then went in, grab me a box if mm -hmm. they want to see it. Oh, yes. That let's, we use. Let's see it. Let's see it. Okay. okay. Uh, this isn't what we use for reptiles. We buy reptile approved boxes. But we cut the paneling to fit the inside of the box. Mm -hmm. so that it fits snugly on the outside. Pack it tight um, with newspaper. Um, oh, a trick that a lot of people don't know about is if the heat pack is directly on the cup, it will cook the animals. And so I usually have like about that much or like half 
minute or so in between the animals and the heat pack so that I have they can get warmth but not be like too much warmth. Yep. Yeah, totally. That's that's been my experience too. I always try to wrap it in something, like wrap it in a few thicknesses of newspaper or bubble wrap or something, to keep that away. Because mm -hmm. yeah, people don't realize that even the the animal uh, intended heat packs, the slow release ones, like the Uniheat, which is what I use. Well, they get to 117 degrees. Yeah, they still get hot. They're not like 165 like some of the other ones, but it's still hot enough to cook mm -hmm. the ice if they're too close. I will so wrap it in newspaper and tape it to the lid so it can't fall down and compress on the animals. Hmm. Yep, that's smart. Let's see. All right. Oh, and Heather Jensen, I haven't received the package yet, but if you sent it to my uh, PO box, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to go check it because I haven't. I haven't done that in the very recent past, so I will go check that out. Um, all right. And Frank Detank just linked to your website. Thank you, Frank Detank. I think that's the second time you've done that. So everybody, copy that, Thanks, paste Frank. it somewhere, and and check it out if you haven't been there, or even if you have, just go visit again. There's always something cool going on. So. What, uh, we had a couple of questions. I'm just kind of filtering through because I missed some. Um, let's see. I think it was Muhammad asked, and I'm just remembering it because I can't see it now. He was asking, if you could only keep one armadillidium species, which one would it be? I'd have to keep the officinalis. Oh, wait, there aren't armadillidium. They don't count. <laughs> That's true. They're armadillidium. Gosh, now I have to think of it. <laughs> I, I'd probably have to say vulgaric because there's so much variety to work with. Yeah. That was one of my choices too. It's a toss up between that with all those different morphs and Armadillidium gestroid because I just love that species. Oh, they're so pretty. Yeah. Um, I like how it seems like the females seem to have white skirting while the males don't. That is kind of a cool thing, isn't it? And I love how instead of, you know, some of the isopods will be like Bulgaria, just the wild types. You'll get kind of a lot of markings when they're little and as they grow up, they lose them. But yeah. gestroid just gets crazier and more intense. They awesome. do, they get more and more brighter yellow spots. Yeah. Okay, what is the largest armadillidium? Noah asks. It's difficult to say. I've measured all of mine. I know the mm -hmm. gastroid is really up there. Yeah. Uh, the CF frontizotre is also really large. And CF means confer, which means probably <laughs> so it yeah. hasn't been definitively identified but we're like i'm pretty sure or at least it looks like this um they also a fun fact now that i was talking about the frontizotre the official name for them is actually palazzi uh they were identified twice but when they were introduced to the hobby they're introduced under the name frontizotre so that's how they're being traded in the hobby oh okay that makes sense yeah, there's some really big ones out there. And the funny thing is, too, a lot of them don't reach their maximum size. It yeah, takes them three generally. years. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I told you about the uh, gigantic zebra I found that I had in a bioactive <laughs> gecko tank. <laughs> I, I was looking in there, and there was this huge zebra, like three times bigger than I've ever seen one. Because I it was just a really itself. big guy, too, once. And I waited half an hour for him to stop moving so I could measure it. Because <laughs> he was upset. I took him out of his dub. <laughs> oh, Ash M, thank you for the super chat. Um, so Ash M says, just wanting to express gratitude to you both for being so willing to share information about this hobby. Laura, all of my cultures are doing great. Well, I'm so glad to hear that, Ash. Excellent. Thank you. And Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, thank you again for your super chat earlier, asks... Will Marulanella species tricolor or ember B be available? I have just seen people in Europe start to breed them. Um, so as soon as I can find someone willing to part with them, um, I'll be having them cultivated here. Um, the tricky part is they apparently don't do well with shipping. And so I'll have to see if they survive the transit. I've already contacted a couple of European breeders uh, to let me know when they're available so I can import them. Cool. Those those uh, Marulanella species tricolor are... They're breathtaking. Unbelievable, yeah. They're so cool. <laughs> I, it's hard to believe something like that even exists. But uh, mm -hmm. 
That, that's an amazing thing. About it. More of them. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I saw like a, a bumblebee one too posted the other day. Uh-huh. Like Is it's crazy. The what's, there there was emberbee and then there was a bumblebee too. Oh, okay. And then there I, I have trouble remembering them because they're such funky names, but I think there's at least one or two other ones that they've found and shared. Okay. Well, it'll be it'll be fun when they finally make their way over here in, in large numbers. Um mm-hmm. Therapod Hunter is asking about how long it takes to introduce an isopod species to the hobby. Uh, it really depends on how fast they breed and how much were initially collected. Mm-hmm. Uh, for like new species, a lot of times it'll take like a year or two before they can be distributed between people, like large amounts. Um, because But I usually cultivate animals in my cultures for at least a year because I want to make sure that they're breeding well, they're breeding correctly, and I want to make sure they get their numbers into a couple hundred so that when I start allowing people to purchase them that the cultures don't crash. Because sometimes Mm -hmm. they'll keep pulling and pulling and pulling and then they'll get upset and then they'll stop breeding and then that's all I got, you know? Yeah. It can take even upwards of I think one of the Spanish species I bred really slowly, I kept for three years. I only started releasing Hilaria the last year or so. And I actually cultivated them for two or three years before I started releasing them because I wanted to make sure they had a stable population. Yeah, that makes sense, especially with such a slower breeding species. So Dan, a new uh, patron, just asked a question, said, uh, your logo and stickers are fantastic. Is there a story behind them? Uh, actually, yes, there is. When I first got, this is the Hilaria. Oh, sorry. I lost when, the, uh, <laughs> let me put that on the, the stream again. Solo layout. Here we go. Wow. That is a nice big isopod, isn't it? They are just beautifully large animals. Oh, wow. That's an impressive ice You can really see their eyes, which I think is so fun. So cool. But um, here's our logo. Um, When I actually commissioned, I commissioned Emily Burke. She's the one who made this. I told her, I said, I have a lot of people that are telling me that they think that bugs are so gross and so disgusting. I said, I need something cute. And so what I want you to make me, I want you to make me the Disney princess of roaches. And she delivered. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly what she is. I love that. See, she has like little eyelashes and she's got a cute little nose going on. Um, At first she just had regular antenna and I was like, no, I want them to be feathery. And she did a great job. Yeah, that that is great. I love the description. It totally works. (laughs) Disney princess of roaches. That's great. Oh, Dan has another question. Uh, or well, and this is more of a comment, but says, by the way, the isopods I've gotten from you are happy and healthy, and I can't wait for the ones coming in tomorrow. Oh, that's so exciting. I hope you enjoy them too, Dan. Let's see. So Ben's Bug says, when will Smug Bug get Witch's Brew? And that's the Porcelio Arnatus uh, cultivar. Uh, did you want to turn the camera back on for us, Russ? Yes. So <laughs> I sometimes forget to do that. I gotta we, can, we can just leave the smug cam on the side <laughs> so we can stop flicking back and forth. That's true. Um, <laughs> uh, the Witch's Brew, actually, I think they have about 50 to 100 in culture that have been isolated. When I start isolating a culture, I grab as many of the visual animals as I can, and I separate them from the main population, and then I allow them to reproduce. And then I pull all their visual offspring from the tub, and I place them in a new culture that I consider F1s. And then I allow them to reproduce until I think I have a couple hundred. And so I think that they just finished their last breeding cycle. There should be another one that happens this summer. And so this fall, we'll see where their numbers are at because I have a good amount of larger animals that are actually breeding ready. And I have isolated it. I just need them to build up their population. Oh, okay, cool. I brought some of the lemon sorbet here today too, which is another Ornatus morph. Oh yeah, let's check those out. 
And this is what I think is a T negative albino of Ornatus. And the T negative, the T stands for tyrosinase. And usually it's used to discuss snakes. But what it means is it is a true albino, because if it's tyrosinase positive, it still technically can produce um, darker pigments. But these have clear eyes. So they don't produce or retain any pigments. Okay. Wow. And that they get this something. cute little yellow tinge to them. Yeah. Yeah, those, I remember when you sent me the pictures of those and I used them in the video on Porcelia or Notus, they're just, Lemon Sorbet is the perfect name for them. <laughs> <laughs> they're super cute. Yeah, they're very cool. And Ornatus is so fun because they're so active. You get a big culture of those going and they're just everywhere. Oh yeah. They love to collect in the cork bark so you can really tell how many there are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They are so cool. The ones that I, uh, the, the Porcelli or Nordis Nord that I got for you, from you recently, have a, a nice clutch of babies in there now. Oh, that's so, great. The babies are well. so funny because they're like little shrinky dinks. <laughs> that's awesome. So Duke Omega is wondering what kind of isopods you might suggest for an emerald tree skink bioactive enclosure. Um. I'm not too familiar with emerald tree skinks, but I think that they like to be humid. Um, so what I would suggest, and they actually, the emerald tree skinks have a benefit of having thick skin. A lot of people get concerned with the thin-skinned reptiles like crested geckos um, about scabers overwhelming them because they're protein hungry. Emerald tree skinks have thick skin, so you can put almost anything in there with them. Right. Um, a lot of people like to combine the dwarf whites in a larger species. I have been coming encountering a problem frequently where the dwarf whites outbreed the larger species, and the larger isopods are much better at eliminating waste than the smaller ones are. And so a really good isopod would actually be either Lavis or Scaver. Um, they will be predated on because they're large enough for the skink to see and I think they're insectivores but the once they get a good population they will eliminate the waste really well especially like shed skins or poops or whatever yeah. um when starting bio it's a good to keep like a half and half thing like keep a culture a good healthy culture separate from the tank so in case the skink goes ham and eats all of their cleaners you can just keep re-adding them back right that makes a lot of sense I uh and I've, I've used Lavis as a cleanup crew, and you just have to, you know, you make sure you match species, but they're exceptional. They're, they're they really are. great. Well, I gave them a rat pup one time, a snake um, wouldn't eat, and they had it gone within a day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when I've put, sometimes I'll have pinkies left over from feeding the snakes when they're not hungry or whatever, and toss a pinky in there. And I know it's not a rat pup, but that thing's gone within a couple hours. Boom. Yeah. When I throw it in with the dairy cows. Well, even take apart the bones. And like, I've caught them like taking bones and like taking them into their burrows because those lathes burrow down too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, people worry about, well, they're so protein hungry, they're going to eat what it is. But just like you're saying with emerald tree skinks, you don't have to worry as much as you would with something really soft bodied. So it works out. Um, all right. We got some more. Oh, we got a ton of questions. I want to make sure that we get a chance to see more of your critters because I know you brought a lot. I'm going to uh, add. <laughs> Heather has a comment. She says she has a project that she can't do because she wants to move and doesn't want to create another thing to move, but an ant plant, ant farm terrarium, specific plants that host ants. Wow. That would be something. Yeah, that's really cool. I don't know much about ants, but. But, but that is neat. That sounds I, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, should we take a look at one of the other critters you've got there? Yeah. Do you want to see my weird vulgari? Yeah. Let me put it on uh, solo layout so we can see it well. I haven't named these yet. They're just labeled as weird vulgari. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they're born white. And then as they color up, they have an orange base and have yellow spotting as well. And there's even, I think, some dark pigment because they have dark eyes. Hmm. And this is entirely separate um, from the Magic Potion and the other strange. This popped up in the Vulgari I collected in North Dakota. Interesting. Those, 
have a very unique look like to it. This little guy, he's so pretty. Yeah. If anyone has name suggestions, let me know. I don't know what to call him. Those are very cool. Wow. And it's and there's there's something about the different patterns with Bulgari that you get somewhere. It looks like the pigment is deposited deep down, and sometimes it's deposited on. Yeah, it's like layered the on them. Yeah, and, and so the this different is cultures unique... like the Punta Cana is striped. Um, the Saint Lucia has like large dots of yellow. It's really interesting how expressive. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me. I, I still don't have the Santa Lucia. I need to get those. Um, I always say it the way the Italians say it. It's probably not the way most people say it, but um, those those are super cool. I don't have those. I have the Punta Canas, and I love those. They're uh, the variety. That's that's the thing. Like we were both talking about earlier, the variety in in Bulgaria is just fantastic. And these are just these are really cool. So how many do you have of these now? Do you have a a large colony of them going? Um, I have, I want to say about 50. Okay, so not bad. It's coming so, along. Yeah, they're getting there. <laughs> yeah. That is cool. What do you think the species of isopod with the most morphs is at this point? The scaber, definitely. I have like 30 different cultures of scaber. I think there's even more. Someone was just texting me today about a red-edged gaber from France, and I was like, I haven't even heard of this thing. Cool. There, there are, yeah, and I guess it makes sense because that one is the the oldest hobby isopod. Yes, they were the first morph, I think, 10 or 15 years ago, the orange morph that they released on the market in Europe. Yeah, yeah, the one where uh, Orrin McMonagall got some from Europe in the 90s, I think, and, yeah. and that's where they came from. Yeah, so that's cool. They, uh, and I don't even have, I just have a few scaber morphs. I probably have like, I don't know, half a dozen or something, but there's so many. I have an entire shelf of scaber. <laughs> there's so many of them in my house. <laughs> they're, they're fun because they both have recessive mutations. The lava is the dominant one. I think it's the only dominant one in the hobby. And then they have so much potential for line bread mutations. Oh, like yeah. my lemonades are a line bread mutation of scaber. Mm -hmm. They have America, the calico is a sex connected gene. In Europe, it is it is present in both males and females, which is really interesting. Yeah, I've actually got a really weird one that's showing up that from stowaways in my Hoffman's egg eye culture, some Porcelia scaver got in there and I've been trying to get them out forever, but they, <laughs> uh, it's hard because they look just like Hoffman's egg eye babies. <laughs> they do. They do. And and I it, they started throwing something that looks like yellow snow, these these scavers in there. Oh, that's a lot of fun. It's really interesting. So I did pull them out, and we'll see what happens. But um, okay, let's let's check out some of your geckos. I see you got one right there. Yeah, she was she was mad, so I thought I'd let her out of her cup for a little bit. Um, this is my Saracenorum. This is Surrey. She's one of my breeders, and she is oh. a white colored spotted Saracenorum. And they are called Saracen's giant gecko. They're another New Caledonian species. Uh, they obviously don't get as large as the lychees, but they get a, a pretty good length. That's a pretty hefty gecko. Size yeah. There. yeah, I think she's about 60 grams. She's not gravid. She's just chunky. Wow. <laughs> that, that's a really cool looking gecko. I like it. Do they, do they drop their tails? And if so, they do, they, and they grow back. They grow back. Okay. She hasn't dropped hers. If they drop their tails, they grow back a different color. Mm-hmm. Uh, with different patterning. I have a Saracen with a drop tail. And, it, and when it's funny because when it grows back, it looks like a little bumblebee stinger until it gets back normally. Huh, interesting. <laughs> I got I got one of each gecko species up here, which is kind of fun. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Well, I don't have it, one of each species. I have three different kinds of Eurydactylid species. These are Veilardi. Oh, I love and those. They're so funny. I call them my gecko slugs. Um, <laughs> they don't, they can jump. Sometimes they do when they're like really mad. Most of the time they choose to scoot sideways when they're upset. And so I don't know if I can get them to do it on camera, but they'll just scoot or, like, cause they like to grip twigs on mm -hmm. that are like the length of their arms. And oh, um, then they just kind of sidle back and forth. But they can 
kind of avoid a predator by having the, the, the stick in in front of them, so to speak. Yeah, well, yeah. they just look like a weird little piece of bark. Like, why would someone eat that? Yeah. They so are these so are Vailardi. I also have Agricole and Occidentalis, and they have really subtle differences, like in the scale pattern. But these are a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And I love how they're, they're small geckos, but they, they handle more like a larger gecko. Yeah. Yeah, that's I got to handle some at a reptile show once and I thought, oh, someday, someday. <laughs> they can be sensitive, so it's not something I recommend if people want something they can handle a lot. But um, they are actually quite active for their size. Yeah. This is one of my gargoyles. She's actually an animal I produce. She's a little bit in shed, but you can see her pattern, which is the important part. Um, this is from the Orange oh, wow. Blotch Project. Wow. So I hatched her out about a year ago. Hopefully she is breeding size by next year. But she's got, I think she's considered a super blotch. Just this really bright orange blotchy yeah. pattern saturated with the bright oranges on her. That is that is seriously one of the coolest looking gargoyles I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she's. I was really excited. Uh, well, I actually almost sold her because she didn't have that much pattern and then she didn't sell. And as she grew out, it's like, man, am I glad I didn't sell you. Yeah, that is pretty fantastic. It's like orange swirl sherbet on a, on a gargoyle <laughs> gecko. <laughs> and this is a Chihua. Oh, this nice. is Todd. <laughs> I think he's considered a white collar. His collar He's fired down now, so it's not showing as much. But when he's under UVB, he gets really bright. He's got some pinks in him, which is really nice. This is the Pine Island locale of Chihua. Mm -hmm. And he's paired up to a, fe a female that has really nice red undertones. They laid their first clutch. I'm really excited to see how it hatches out. I've been raising these Chihuahuas from babies, and they're finally getting the breeding age. And it's like, oh, oh you're cool. just so little. <laughs> So do the Chihuahuas pair up like lychees do? They, yeah, you, I have heard of some people doing groups, but from what I, I, I'm pretty new to Chihuahuas, but from talking to other breeders and from what I was researching, um, they do best in pairs. Cool. And a lot of times um, people will switch through males because they'll put two together and they just act like roommates hanging out. They don't actually breed together. Huh. But they're a really cool animal. They're really intelligent. Um, a lot of them are really laid back and they can tolerate a lot of handling. And they can also tolerate a lot of warmth because I see them under their basking spot all the time. Ooh, so not as sensitive as some of the other New Caledonians to warm temperatures. Mm -hmm. oh, I give them a cool area to retreat to, of course, but they really right. enjoy the basking. All right. Therapod Hunter sent a super chat in and it has a suggestion for your. Mm -hmm. uh, for your vulgari morph that you showed us, the, the interesting orange one says, "How does I want to hear it. how does vulgari ocelot sound?" Oh, that's so cute! <laughs> I like that. That's pretty cool. These are new Anna lychees. Um, these are two full-grown adults. They're about they range between 170 and 190 grams, depending on when the last time they pooped was. Um, uh, this is a breeding pair. You can see this one, um, she was actually valued lower because she doesn't have a lot of color, but she's got really large white splotches. And this guy has actually, he's lime green and he has purple pink splotches on him. Wow. And this locale is smaller. It's the smallest right next to new Ami, I think. Um, but they're also known to be the most colorful. And they're not aggressive really at all. Like, sometimes I hear him croaking. It's funny because when he's trying to seduce her, he croaks like a frog. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like I have an African bullfrog in my room. <laughs> but they haven't really shown me any aggression. I have offered them uh, feeders a couple of times. And mm -hmm. I have to almost upset them, whacking them in the face of it before they finally take it. Because oh. they're just, like in here, when I had her, I had an incubation malfunction and I had to a gecko without eyes. And so instead of like killing it, because I really didn't want to do that, I offered it to her and she hid from it instead of eating it. <laughs> so wow. I had to offer it to a different <laughs> animal. I was like, really? Like, you're made for this. Yeah, that's interesting. 
I wonder if there's anything to be said for the fact that in captivity they've not been selected for that kind of thing. If they lose, if they're less predatory than they were in the wild or something. That that could be part of it, but I've heard like the really large locales, like the GT and the point de maze, just being like very readily eating animals. Really? Um, this is a crested gecko. I'm sure a lot of people have these. Um, this is from one of my red projects. And oh, yeah. this is a juvenile male, so he's not quite there yet, but I'm hoping he reaches breeding weight uh, by the end of the summer so I can do a late, late season pairing with him because he just has this gorgeous vibrant red color to him. Oh, yeah. And he's been in a cup for about an hour now. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he's extra mad and extra fired up right now. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a pretty one. And such a clean, clean pattern right down the back with the. Oh, it really does. Like yeah. he's got an empty dorsal here. Oh, yeah. That is really nice. He is a gorgeous animal. He's one of my favorites. Let's see. So Noah asks if you have any king snakes. I don't have king snakes. I do have some snakes. Mm -hmm. And I actually. Um, managed to convince Ben to let me to breed. It, it's not like I asked my husband permission. It's just, I don't want to do something he's uncomfortable with. So I finally got him to the point he's comfortable so that I'm going to breed some blood pythons. That's all the geckos uh, I have. If you want to cool. go back to the two camera thing. Okay. Cool. Um, so I got, I have a really large, she's a six foot long blood python. She, when I weighed her, she's 12 pounds, but I'm not sure how accurate that was, if my scale was or whatever, but I got a, and she's a T positive albino. So she's yellow and red. She's really gorgeous. So I got a male for her. So I'm hoping to breed them in about three years because she is 12 pounds and he's like eight ounces. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I have um, some Sambos. I love Sambos. They're so funny. I named all of mine after noodles. <laughs> I, have, I have udon, uh, fettuccine, and then we just got another one in. I haven't quite named her yet. And then I just got a hognose snake in. So I have a tricolor hognose, but those are uh, just pets. The cool. blood pythons are the ones I was considering breeding. Yeah, I've been intrigued by the idea of blood pythons because they seem like they're very, um, they got that impressive girth to them. They seem pretty laid back if you can you have to work with them to get to that point a lot of the time my female the is really docile but i've handled her a lot i've never had a problem no. with her the male i opened up his bag and he was immediately trying to murder me so most people i guess have a lot of problem with their blood pythons being really aggressive so i'm hoping he kind of um chills out but it might just be his personality we'll have to see Mm. Yeah, and I've heard that it, it's kind of like it takes a while to earn their trust, but once you do, you're kind of in. <laughs> Something like that. The, uh, my female, her name is Eleanor, so we call her Ellie. Whenever you open her tub, she like has to tell you her feelings, but she never, she never strikes or anything. She just hisses a lot until you pick her up, and then she's fine. Huh. Oh, we've got another super chat. This is from the Tarantula Collective says, hello, Russ and Laura, enjoying the stream. That crested gecko was gorgeous. Well, thank you, Richard. Thank you so much, Richard. That's awesome. Let's see. Oh, um, Sandy Sizemore wants to know if you keep toke geckos, and if so, any morphs? I had toke geckos um, before I had my kids, but I had uh, 15 heat lamps and eight heating pads going. And so those were one of the animals that uh, left me right before I had my twins. But I did have them for a while, and they're such wonderful geckos. I really miss them a lot. I wish that I had kept them. Um, but I named I named her Gus because I thought it was a male because she had such aggressive pores. And it was actually a wild-caught animal that I basically rehabilitated. I got her for... $15 um, locally because someone bought her an expo and they didn't know what to do with her. And so they sold her off locally. So I retook her and I had her for about three years. And at the end of the three years, she would just walk out onto my hand and take bugs for me. Like they're, they're such intelligent animals. I actually read that they uh, will breed for life and defend the corpse of their mate. Wow. If it dies. Wow. 
I, I knew that they had done some pair bonding, that they would do pair bonding. I didn't know that they would go that far. That's amazing. It's nanners. Like they'll even, I've only ever seen that behavior described in skinks in Australia. Mm -hmm. Like the pine cone skinks and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 yeah that's interesting. I, I've always been fascinated by toke because they seem, like you said, they seem really intelligent. I had actually, somebody offered me one but I didn't have a place for it at the time, so I had to decline. But I've I've been interested. They just they're fascinating. I had to wear gardening gloves for the first year. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it wasn't so much the actual bite, but mm -hmm. when she would bite down, she wouldn't let go. Mm -hmm. So that way I could just slip off the glove and put her back in the cage <laughs> with the glove rather than like sitting here with this angry animal on my hands for like an hour <laughs> until she chose to let go. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's just easier to handle that way. Oh, and Supreme Gecko says tokes will group defend against predators too. Yeah, they do. They have a lot of interesting behaviors. Oh, so cool. And they they protect their their eggs, don't they? They protect they the do. Eggs area. Yeah. I saw and when I was in a Toke Gecko group, someone posted a photo. I, I think they were in the Philippines or somewhere in Southeast Asia. They had pulled their dresser away from the wall and there were Toke Gecko eggs glued all over the wall and two <laughs> very angry parents and a couple of little babies all in this like little area. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I When I lived in Hawaii, there were Toke Geckos around, but I didn't see any... Uh, I didn't encounter any nests, but I we would get the morning geckos nest in our house and the house geckos too, and they would they would come back to the same spots and yeah. nest in the same spots just like they do if you keep them in a vivarium. It was pretty cool. So we'd be like, "Oh, these eggs are about to hatch. Here we go. Keep an eye out for little geckos on the wall." And it was, it was that's fun. so much fun. <laughs> I live in North Dakota, so we have sometimes box elders that come inside and visit me. <laughs> 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 yeah, we get those too. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know what? Someone asked before, and I forgot to check, if uh, if you can ship to Florida. Can you ship isopods to Florida? Yes, I can. Cool. I have some permits for Florida. Nice. I am still waiting on my uh, my specimen, whatever it's called, where you have to send them specimens, and, and they have to approve them. So... I'm still waiting on that. It's been a long time. I've been waiting. <laughs> Let's see. That's the only state besides Hawaii I can't ship to, though. Yeah, I've had a couple of people request to ship to Hawaii, but that is a that's a hard no go. They have they're almost as strict as Australia. Mm -hmm. They're very strict. When I lived there, when I shipped out of Hawaii, I had to bring any plant I wanted to because I used to ship aquarium plants out of Hawaii. Because mm -hmm. it was about the only thing that I could raise and, and sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to bring them personally to the inspection station and get them inspected and then finish packing them there at the inspection station. And they put their special tape and all their stuff all over the box. And they, yeah, it was, and that's to go out. And it's even wow. worse going in. It's even worse. Yeah. So, well, I suppose they don't want you to like be sending out native animals or something. Right. Right, and they and they want to make sure no pests go back and forth because there are pests in Hawaii that could be problems elsewhere too. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Let's see. Rebelicious says in Florida caught over a hundred isopods, two kinds: one dark, huge, and shiny. One kind has different patterns and are way lighter. Hmm. The dark and shiny one is probably a labus. Oh, it could be. I would guess the one with a lot of patterns is. Probably a muscorum or something like that, some sort of Philoscaia genus. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of isopods in Florida. Um, I have a lot of friends that go collecting down there, and they'll be like, "What's this?" And I'll be like, "I have absolutely no idea, but it is amazing. <laughs> like, you should take a lot more pictures of that thing." Yeah, yeah. I I loved going to Florida. I did uh, kind of a herping trip there once, and uh, I found I only found one isopod the entire time I was there. I was unlucky as far as isopods go, but I found some cool millipedes. And, they, and they have an amazing amount of fauna, like native and naturalized. Like I know right. a lot of the reptiles are pests, but it's amazing. Like people will say that it gets cold one night and there'll be chameleons falling out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Or iguanas too. I've heard a lot about iguanas, like the road will be covered yeah. in iguanas and then they'll just, they'll warm up and walk away. <laughs> yeah. Well, I encountered a number of iguanas when I was there. That was pretty cool. 
That was very cool. Oh yes, no, the day geckos in Hawaii, very fun. I used to know. Oh, they're so pretty. We had one that was kind of a little beach shop that was about 20 minutes from our house, and there was a, a wild gecko that would just come and bask by the light by the uh, in the the, uh, the cashier's corner of the store. It would just hang out there. I've seen uh, videos of people at like restaurants and they'll set up a station of like honey on like a little sushi dish thing. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, geckos will be licking honey off it together. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're really not very afraid of people. They're kind of fun that way. I've got some more isopods here. If we want to turn on that camera again. Yes, let's do it. Here it comes. These are what I called papaya. These are a mutation of Cubaris that spontaneously appeared in my wild type Cubaris culture and, or my Cubaris murina. And I know some people have been distributing these as Cubaris species papaya so they can raise the mic. All papayas are definitely murina. <laughs> there aren't any <laughs> other pink Cubaris I've seen on the market. So it's not like they're super special. Um, the ancestors of these were actually collected in Florida. Cool. But some of them, for a long time, they had red eyes. But now that I look at them closer lately, it seems like some have black eyes. So I thought they were true albinos. But they might just be a uh, teapot albino or something, which is why they're pink. But some even show up as white. They have some variation in culture, which is a lot of fun. Interesting. That is pretty cool, especially the fact that you're getting the eye variation after they've already lost the pigment and then they're like getting it back. That's weird. It is really weird. So those are the papaya. They breed really well because they're marina and they're cubara, so they're adorable. Yeah. They've got a lot going for them. They are very cool. And who wouldn't want a pink isopod? That's pretty awesome. I um, I think that they're the only pink isopod really being widely traded. There mm -hmm. is the rosy pink woodlouse, which is Agabiformius lentis. Mm -hmm. But um, those aren't really commonly traded. Most cultures are actually Trichiniscus bacillus, not the lentis. Or not lentis, not Androniscus dentiger is the rosy woodlouse. That's what I was thinking. Oh, okay. I get by formula lentils is pretty common right now and not pink. These are orange tiger. These are a locale of Cubaris collected in the Surat Thani district of Thailand. And I actually got the in from Exo Pete in Germany. He went and collected them himself, but they have a light orange base and deep orange stripes on them. Oh, very cool. So kind of similar to red tiger, but not quite the same. They, they're they probably entirely different species, honestly. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's so there's a lot of interesting variations in Cubaras over there. Yeah. they. It's hard to tell if they're all the different species, if it's uh, different characteristics because they've been separated. Like, because you'll see like different locales, like even in lychees, um, they're so different between the different islands mm -hmm. or if they are entirely different species and they just pick that one niche to settle in. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, um, Coley Poli says, um, come visit us in the, uh, in Florida on the edge of the Ocala national forest. Happy to take you velvet ant hunting. We have nine types. That sounds awesome. Velvet ants are so cute. Oh, I that love sounds that. like a lot of fun. Yeah. Totally love velvet ants. Oh, whoa. I think I know what these are. I... Should I get your hand action? Oh, it's better go. without That's the light. better without it. There, we got rid of our desk lamp and it looks better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are uh, bolivari. Mm, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Are a Spanish giant. They're not quite as large as Hoffman's egg guy, um, but they are pretty big and up there. You kind of see them on my hand there. And these are fun because these 
these males will duke it out. Like I, every time I go in there, there's some juvenile male that was too big for his britches and he's missing pieces of himself because he made someone mad. <laughs> Do they have the little bumps on their, uh, the front yes. part of their carapace to beat on each other with? I don't know if I can get it on the camera, but they have little spines on top of their head. You can kind of see it there. I have some. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You can see little bumps there a little bit. Some photos on the website and um, the Facebook page. Some up close photos of them, but they have like they're almost a spiny isopod in their own right, you know? Yeah, yeah. They're very unique. This is a gravid female here. Oh yeah, there's the marsupium. Awesome. Not enough that she's grabbing and releasing her eggs because I'm handling her, but enough you can tell. You can see it, yeah. Oh, so Ash M is asking which isopod species is the bluest blue? And I guess we should exclude, exclude aridovirus, of course, but just that are naturally the bluest blue. Gosh, I don't know. I have one that's purple. Ooh. I don't think there's any that are blue. Ben, do we have any blue ones? Like a powder blue? Oh, I guess Prunosa is kind of has a blue tinge. They can have a blue tinge. I've seen photos in Oren's book, Isopod Zoology, of a Porcelio species that in the right light looks kind of blue. Yeah. I'm trying to remember which, if it's Porcelio wagneri, can look blue sometimes. The, the wagneri looks so black to me. I haven't really noticed any blue. The prunosa is blue, but I think it's a trick of the eye because it's the the powder. Because the powder of them is actually a wax, which is a defensive feature, so that they can fend off predators and infection. Right. But um, the the wax breaks up the light wavelength, so it makes them appear blue. Which is kind of like a blue death fighting beetle. It's kind of the same idea. Yeah. Uh, these we got here are expanses. I love expanses. Got to be my favorite Porcelio. I think they're the widest Porcelio. Yeah, they look absolutely massive when they're full grown. They're crazy. These aren't. Yeah, these aren't fully mature, but they're still pretty impressive. Yeah, they are. They the most trilobite like of isopods probably. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> so Dan from uh, Patreon again is asking. Are researchers in touch with breeders to help gather data on newly discovered isopods? I haven't been able to find researchers. I contacted the guy from the USDA. He has not been able to either. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if somebody knows somebody who does isopod research, please email me and let me know so I can send them samples. Yeah, I would like to know too. I think that would be really cool. We need to get some of those folks... Uh, on our team, so to speak. <laughs> I could send them so many samples for identification if I could just find somebody. Yeah, exactly. I think I think there are a lot of us who would be willing to participate if we just knew. Oh, yeah. Oh, Heather Jensen says the University of Ice, Iowa does isopod research. They do. That's awesome. That's great. Thanks, that, Heather. That could be a good, uh, good way to get started. So Ash M says she feels like the fronti rostre are blue when I look at them. Hmm. Cool. I haven't worked with those yet. I have to look at them under the right light, I think. I have LEDs because I have trouble seeing. <laughs> I have really bad eyes. <laughs> <laughs> these were actually, I, these are Mardi Gras, Aniscus acellus Mardi Gras. It's a Dalmatian morph and Aniscus acellus. And my friend TJ Ombrell isolated these. And fun story, I actually helped him name them. Oh, that's awesome. I was being ridiculous. And I was like, you should call them Mardi Gras because they got yellow, black, and white flex. And he's like, oh, let's go with it. That is cool. I, I think so. they're, they're really gorgeous and, and underrated. A lot of people get nervous because they think they like to be cool. I keep them at 75 with the other isopods and the geckos. What they don't like is they don't like temperature fluctuations. fluctuations. So if they're used to living in a 60 degree environment and all of a sudden you throw them into a 75 degree one, they're not going to do well. Yeah. yeah that they have to be awesome. acclimated. I haven't had mine uh, have a lot of problems either. Uh, I got some wild types and I have the uh, BC maples 
and they do okay. I mean, I had a little die off when I first got my BC maples because probably there were temperature fluctuations on the chip, but the ones mm -hmm. that settled down have, have produced for me and I've got babies. Have you had white show up in your maples? Um, not yet, but I haven't had them for very long either. So keep an eye out for that because the guy who isolated the maples also had whites show up. Cool. I had two show up, but none since. So I'm hoping that they reproduce more and I can isolate it. So John Racine, patron, just asked if some Porcelia Levis marketed at re as red-eyed isopods, he bought some that were marketed that way, that thinks they're just orange. Do all Porcelia Levis orange have red eyes? I want to say they have black eyes. Most of the orange morphs uh, of isopods, it's like a T positive albino. So they produce darker pigment, but they only retain it in like their extremities and eyes. Um, so like you'll see like the prunosis, the scaber, um, the nasodum, they all have dark eyes. Okay, that makes sense. I'm trying to reference my own photos right now. <laughs> uh, what we got in the camera right here, these are Porcelionata's high yellow. So I have um, some really high yellow individuals. This one running away from me, that is a lesser high yellow. Um, it's got more dark markings. These are this, gorgeous. They are. This is actually not a morph. This is a locale of Ornatus. It, um, I'm not entirely sure exactly where they were collected. I've been trying to talk to some Spanish breeders and they don't have exact data for me, but the dark form or what's called yellow dot of Ornatus was collected in Southern Spain. So I think these were collected in either Eastern or Northern Spain. Okay. There is a morph that has been bred from this called chocolate. So oh, yeah. instead of having a black or gray base against the yellow it's a brown i think i had a couple of those pop up in my culture most of mine have the dark kind of black or gray but they kind of go hand in hand sometimes because when you have a culture pop up and you start isolating morphs out of it um you don't necessarily get that morph out 100 percent because you can't tell which one's a heterozygous or not like you can purify a morph but it's really hard to reverse isolate it from the existing population Right. Yeah, that makes sense. When these guys have a lot of yellow, they have so much yellow. It's so pretty. What I really like about the Ornatus is that they have such a meaty body. Yeah. Yeah, they're solid, like little tanks, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're fantastic. I, I have one specimen that showed up that looks almost entirely solid yellow. It's, it's, it's kind of... They fun. are beautiful animals. I just referenced my latest photos, and my entire orange culture has black eyes to answer, yeah, I believe, John's question. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Thank you for that. I even have some that have a high white along their back, so they have, like, a milky or white stripe. Mm. And um, they, did, they even had black eyes. Are they almost like a milk back, an orange milk back, sort of? Yeah. I have uh, one of the photos on my website. It looks like an orange milk back. Mm, I'm going to have to check that out. But that was just, it was kind of like a rogue old male. I wasn't able to prove it out. Mm -hmm. These are aficionalis. I won't be able to get them to hiss for everybody. There is a video of them hissing on my Facebook page. Um, but these are just kind of funny. They remind me of the Canadians from South Park. <laughs> well, look at their faces. They have that flat line separating their face. That <laughs> is so together. cool. Yeah, that, that is a unique look on them. That is cool. And they're big, too. Yeah, they really are. This is one of the uh, largest that they get. This isn't even the Israel locale, which is supposed to get a lot larger. This is the Sicily locale. Sicily locale, it has um, less, like, the, the Spain will have, like, kind of a spotty, lighter markings. And the mm -hmm. Sicily has uh, red markings in between the segments, if you can kind of see that. Oh, okay. But these aficionalis are a lot of fun because once they, get, once they get established, they get really comfortable. They breed really quickly. Like I just whacked out some of the cardboard into my hand and you can see all these little babies and large adults and mid-sized animals. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, they're hissing now, but you can't really hear it because the microphone is far away. But they, they produce the hissing sound because they roll up into a tight ball. And then they move their legs in a circular motion on the outside of the inner part of their shell. Mm -hmm. And it's actually more of a rattling, but it sounds like a hissing. So it is a kind of stridulation. That's cool. Yes. Nice. Exactly. So Coley Poli Snow said, I've heard Lemon Blue are extremely poor performers in captivity. Is that your experience? Do you have any tips? I just recently got the Lemon Blue. Um, I've only had them about three months, and they're not dead yet. Oh, well, I think I might have seen babies, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, my motto with Cubaris is set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. So I check on them once every two weeks, and really all I do is I look for dead on the surface. And if I don't see any dead, I consider it good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. like, well, you're not dead. You're probably doing well. Yeah, they do seem, most of them seem pretty secretive. That's true. They seem to stress really easily. So if people mess with them too often, they will die and not reproduce well. Makes sense. Um, this one I have here is a mutation of spiky canary. This is an, a, a full grown adult. And they have, this one's mad, he's standing up in his legs, um, a textured back. They have spikes on their back. And this is actually a mutation. Um, Anthony Molnar uh, isolated it first, and he named them ivory. Cool. Because it's like not quite a white, it's like an off white. They do have white eyes, which I think is very fun. So they're kind of a, an ivory out rather than a white out. <laughs> yes. Well, that's cool. So John Racine is wondering then he, he has red eyed Lavis. So he's wondering if these are a separate morph from orange then. Um, they may be, yes. A lot of people consider the eyes being clear or a different color to make an entirely different morph entirely because it means it's not retaining the pigment um, depositing into the leucistic animals, and this is what it's called, leucism, is they deposit pigment in different areas. A really good example is like an all-white crow with a black beak. Right. Um, they're not considered true albinos, but when they don't deposit pigment in like the extremities or their eyes, that means they may be true albinos. So, so though it's not yellow, it's an albino. Yeah. Frank is asking, so some of his P. Lavis, Lavis whites have a very light, almost faded pink look. Is this something bad or could it be some sort of trait? I think it's probably what they ate. If they're fed a uh, lot of protein, like fish flakes, um, or just a keratinized diet, they will retain coloring from their food. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, I've noticed that uh, some people have sent me pictures of a dairy cow that has like some orange in its antennae or something like that, and said, "Look, I have, I have a cross between orange and, and dairy cow." And I said, "Well, no, it's probably it's just, just dirty." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all the isopods I brought with me today. Cool. Well, that's awesome. We got some some great isopods and some great reptiles as well, some great geckos. Uh, Heather Jensen has the link to the isopod researchers. That's cool. The insect zoo at uh, Iowa State University. That's awesome. Oh, is this the, the guard you showed us before? Yeah, I figured I might as well put something on the camera. Yeah, yeah. She's looking awesome. I, I keep forgetting to switch the camera back and forth. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. It's so cool. I just get distracted because I can see everything. And so for me, I, I, I keep forgetting not everybody sees what I see. I should switch back to maybe not solo layout so we can <laughs> see everybody. You can put it just to me and I'll hold whatever gecko I have. Oh, we can do that too. Let's do that. Yeah, and yeah, both Heather and Sandy are mentioning they have the, the keratinized uh, parotenoidized um, dairy cows. Yeah, and a I've lot of people too. will see it in their legs. Like they get yeah. they get dirt. I don't think they clean their legs very well because their legs seem to get really dirty really fast. And it, like they get orangier and orangier and orangier until they shed and then they're white again. Yeah, yeah, and I'm wondering if there's some of that if they're the carotenoids are being deposited in the outer layers of the exoskeleton too. I don't know, it's interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Whatever, whatever Hearts are just dirty. It's hard Hearts to say. Just dirty, yeah. Wow. I can't get over the colors on that, that gecko. Oh, yeah, she's so pretty. I kept one of her sisters from this year to see how she turns out. There's another one I really wanted to keep because he had a little heart on the back of his head, but it was male, and I don't want to keep too many related animals. It would make sense if I kept her and, like, maybe one or two sisters because I can breed them to the same male because they're all going to be basically related anyway. But mm-hmm. I don't want to have three related animals breeding separately, so I chose just to keep females from this pairing. Okay. That makes sense. Well, well, we've just hit 7 o'clock, and uh, I actually have to be somewhere pretty soon. But it's been too fun, and it's gone way too fast. Yeah, it was but, nice chatting with you, Russell. Yeah, yeah, it's been really, really fun for me, too. And thank you to everyone. Thank you for, for participating. Thank you for uh, joining in. Everybody, make sure you check out Smugbug if you haven't already, or even if you have. Where are the best uh, places to find you? Uh, the Facebook page, I respond to those messages as quickly as possible. And then the uh, website has a contact form that uh, can chat with me directly as well. Excellent. All right. So well, thank you so much today for uh, all your great questions and just seeing all the animals I had to show you guys. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a great uh, cross section of what you got. That was, that was excellent. And the, uh, the ISO cam worked pretty well, so excellent. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks again for joining us. It was great and uh, um, I hope to talk to you again soon. <laughs> Thank you, Russell. I'll talk to you later. Bye. All right. Bye.